I'm afraid that during the editing of this video, I made something of a mistake and accidentally deleted the introductory portion of the video, and so I'm afraid that I'm going to have to do a little stand-in thing here, a bit shorter, in place of the proper introduction. Now you see, for my last reenacting event of this year, I decided to go full-on scum of the earth and uh, grow out some proper Napoleonic sideburns, or at least as close to proper Napoleonic sideburns as I've ever gotten. And so, before shaving off the sideburns and returning to a more civilized mode of life, I figured, you know, it might be a good opportunity to make a video about Napoleonic sideburns. So the actual phrase of sideburns comes from this fellow right here, uh, an American Civil War general by the name of Ambrose Burnsides, and uh, giving a look at his rather, shall we say, particular, rather individual uh, hairstyle, I think we can see where the name comes from. Uh, however, there's also something of a reenactorism that goes around, a bit of a farbism, if you will, in the Napoleonic community that I found. Uh, about the, uh, the origin of the phrase and the reasons behind the wearing of what we now term sideburns in the Napoleonic Wars. Now, a lot of people seem to assume that uh, because the actual wearing of sideburns became popular around this, you know, the early 19th century in the time of the Napoleonic Wars, that the phrasing of sideburns must have also come about around the same time, whereas in the period and indeed, I, I uh, in you know thinking back and doing some research for this video, I realized you know, I don't think I've ever actually read a uh, a Napoleonic source that actually detailed the hair on the side of the face as sideburns. It always seems to refer to them as something else, you know, uh, uh, side whiskers or any other number of things. Uh, again, we're talking about Napoleonic sources here, not people writing about the Napoleonic era, because of course they did wear sideburns in the Napoleonic era, they just wouldn't have been talking about them in that particular way. So the reenactorism, or the farbism, if you will, of sideburns and why they were named as such actually comes from a misconception of why sideburns were worn to begin with. You see, uh, the idea that I've always seen floated around, and indeed something that I used to hold on to sort of half-heartedly myself for a while, was that when firing a musket, of course, this is my musket for the day, so you know, firing the musket, the, the lock being right here or thereabouts, there's going to be a bit of a uh, explosion of smoke and fire and powder and all that stuff relatively close to your face. Um, not a very large explosion, but it is enough to give a little bit of a singe, especially if you over-prime your pan. So uh, the idea going around in the reenacting communities would be that the men would grow out the hair on the side of their face to protect from burning the side of their face from the flesh in the pan. So protecting against the side burns, or the burns on the side of the face, would be your side burns. Seems pretty straightforward, it actually seems to make sense. It's, it's a fairly logical origin for the phrase, and I think that's the reason why it really has caught on so powerfully, especially, of course, due to the fact that we, when looking at the Napoleonic era, be it reenactors, be it films, be it actual paintings and artwork from the time period, well, yes, uh, it's very popularly and commonly known that men wore sideburns during that time period. And so this, this sort of story as to where the term sideburns come from, comes from uh, being sourced in the Napoleonic Wars, it really seems to connect. It seems to make a lot of sense. But it's not strictly true. As we've already covered, it comes from General Burnside. And indeed, that is confirmed by a number of different sources. You know, the, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary is the one that I looked to most immediately to see exactly where the phrase comes from, and indeed it is a mid-Victorian term. But indeed, not only is the term not really uh, uh, applicable, if you will, to this time period, but I don't think that's the reason why the men would have been wearing sideburns to begin with. That itself is another misconception, and that's the deeper thing that I'd like to get to here, is uh, the men would not be growing the hair out on the side of their face to protect against burns from, you know, their, from their uh, locks. So why is it not the case that the men would be growing out the hair on the side of their face to protect against burns? Because it sounds fairly logical, it sounds like a fairly uh, consistent thing to do with the logic of the time period. Why not? Well, if you think about the history, the entire history of musketry, or at least of musketry where uh, there are locks involved which can burn the side of the face, so flint locks, uh, match locks, dog locks, things like that, really until the, uh, say, 1840s, 1830s or thereabouts, when cap locks began to start at least to become more and more popular among the militaries, cap locks being um, 
I won't get into that now, but suffice to say, there is no explosion because there's no powder pouring into a pan. Uh, it, it's a lot more um, peaceful, if you will, for the fire near the face. Um, if you look at the entire history of musketry through those periods, the only time that we see sideburns appear would be the Napoleonic Wars, the very early 19th century, which also happened to be, you know, in the early 19th century, the last days of the flintlock, because we see sideburns carry on in popularity well through the Crimean War and the American Civil War and well onwards, uh, when the the, the, the need to protect the side of one's face against burns is no longer a factor. In the 18th century, in the 17th century, sideburns aren't really a thing. Indeed, the fashion of the 18th century dictated that the men be quite clean-shaven. Uh, in fact, probably more so than could ever be realistically expected of a soldier on a campaign, or at least reasonably so. And indeed, having fired my musket many times in an 18th century uniform, which is to say, uh, longer hair, I wear a wig, but they wear long hair, and uh, clean shaven on the side of the face, I realized while every once in a while firing the musket, you'll get a little bit of, uh, if you're very unlucky, flint or something like that, something back, or a bit of uh, loose powder will shoot up and get you in the cheek, or uh, a bit of steel maybe even. All sorts of things can fly up and sort of sparks will nick at you, as it were. But it's never really a big deal. The absolute worst thing that can happen is something gets into your eye. At that point, you know, maybe you have to, ah, you know, try and rub and get it out and use water to pull, uh, to wash out your eye from your canteen, something like that. But the side of the face? I've never actually even seen someone get a cut on the side of the face as a result of something shooting up from the pan, be it flint or steel or powder or what have you. Um, let alone anyone suffering a very severe burn on the side of their face as a result of the pan going off in front of them. The only real situation in which I can imagine someone getting a burn of any significance to where you know, it would be dictated that an entire army had to take some precaution against it, uh, the only situation I can imagine that happening in would be if someone dramatically overprimed their uh, pan. So, you know, rather than pour a little bit of gunpowder before closing that and reloading the rest of the piece, pouring, the, you know, half of a cartridge or something into the pan and then firing it, you know, really close to their face. That might do something, but for the most part, it's not really that much of a concern. Um, indeed, you're, you're far more uh, likely to be at risk by the muzzle of the man behind you if he isn't aiming properly. You know, if there's, a, if there's one man in the front rank, one man in the rear, and he's firing over your shoulder, if he's a little bit further back, that muzzle, that's where you can get some pretty serious burns, but uh, that's something of an aside. So, I don't think that the need is really there, and indeed I've never seen any historical examples either of the need being there for you to uh, protect the side of your face in any significant fashion against burns. Especially, of course, given the fact that, uh, shall we say, the men back then a bit hardier than, uh, than someone like myself or other reenactors would be when dealing with things like bits of flint or uh, loose powder flying up and hitting you on the side of the face. If I'm able to just go, ooh, bit of a burn, swipe it away and keep on going about the day, something tells me that a soldier who's been on campaign for a number of years, he'll be able to deal with that quite well without needing some sort of extra protection. As something of an aside to this note as well that I just thought of, uh, you may look at some reenactor pictures and see uh, reenactors with great big black uh, uh, marks on the side of their face, especially around the lips right over here. You may, may think, oh wow, that's a pretty bad burn or something. It's not actually a bird. That's just people who happen to bite down a little bit too far on their cartridge and bite into the seat of powder. And so, you, you know, rather than biting just into paper, you're biting directly into powder. You get a lot of it in the mouth, you know. It, it doesn't taste very good. It gets all over the place. It looks like you've been, uh, shall we say, having a bit more fun with your musket than you maybe ought to have been. Uh, but that's all it is. It's not a bird. It's just powder getting all over the place. It's dirty, but it's, it's nothing dangerous. So that's that. Men wouldn't be wearing sideburns to protect the sides of their face. It doesn't really make any sense. And if it did make any sense, something tells me that we would have been uh, that we would see examples of men wearing them far earlier than the waning days of the flintlock musket. Uh, and not to mention, of course, it would probably fall out of style when it no longer became a necessity. So that's out of the way. There it doesn't really make any sense. But then, why would the men be wearing sideburns? Because of course. Regardless of the fact that they wouldn't be wearing sideburns to protect their faces, they were still wearing them. And in fact, it was a very common fashion during the time period. Looking at pictures of generals and to common soldiers, you can see 
in all sorts of paintings and portrayals that sideburns and very thick hair on the side of the face was a very common fashion around the turn of the century, around the, the, uh, the, the beginning of the 19th century and indeed the Napoleonic Wars. So why is that the case? Well, I'm afraid that the answer to that question isn't really all that exciting because, honestly, it's just a matter of military fashion. And indeed, military fashion and civilian, or, or popular we might say fashion, and aristocratic fashion, they were all very closely tied around this time period. The military heroes, if you will, oftentimes set the precedent for what the fashionable young gentleman ought to be looking like during that time period, in the same way that, you know, it was always aristocratic women with their experimental outfits, which really dictated the fashion of their own uh, little sphere. Indeed, a very common example as to the uh, rise of the popularity in the Victorian era of uh, very large beards and mustaches and everything comes from military men deciding to grow their hair out a bit. I think especially in the the Mexican-American War, when the American soldiers going down would, uh, especially the officers, would allow their hair to grow out uh, much, much longer than otherwise would be acceptable in civilian life. And that sort of, you know, everyone looked at that and you know, at first, while it may have been like, oh, well, that's, that's outlandish, that's barbaric, it's unseemly, or it's, it's brutish looking, but it sort of grows on people. And the military began to set the, the fashion of the time period, and soon enough, everyone walking around, you're no real man if you don't have a massive beard to go along with it, or something like that. And uh, that only really began to die out, that mentality of uh, real, you know, proper Victorian and imperial gentlemen and whatnot, soldierly, uh, masculine men, will wear very large facial hair. That only begins to really die out in the early 20th century. If you want to see another example of how military fashion was changing so rapidly and seemingly without any really solid reason behind them during these time periods, uh, look for example at the Shako. The British Shako started off at the, I think it was called the Stovepipe Shako first, and then they, they change over the fashion to the Belgic Shako, and then after the wars, you know, uh, by the time we reach, uh, say, the Crimean or the, uh, the Opium Wars, we begin to see the Shako take on a sort of angular, more uh, uh, blooming type appearance. It's constantly changing throughout the time period. Another favorite here on the channel, bearskin caps. In the American War of Independence, they look extremely different than how they look at the beginnings of the Napoleonic Wars, and then it's something completely even different after the Napoleonic Wars when they take over the French style. Uh, you even have something like, say, Wellington boots, which became very popular among the, uh, you know, the top military minds of the period for, I think, well, rather obvious reasons, given where the name comes from there. Uh, so Wellington boots becoming very popular after the Napoleonic Wars, they decided we should have all the soldiers wear a variant of some sort of Wellington boots. And uh, well, sure, they complain about the fact that after a single parade, the uh, a new recruit who just having put on his boots after a single march, his feet will be so calloused and, and bloodied that removing the boot is like removing a stopper for the well, from the wounds on, on the man's feet after wearing them for so long, well, sure, they're extremely painful and inefficient like that, but they look really good. Same thing with neck stocks. They look really good. It doesn't do a thing, but they look really good. And that is a massive uh, factor in this time period. You want your army to look the best. You want to put on the best show out there that you possibly can alongside being the most efficient. You don't want your army to look like a bunch of ragtag militiamen, national service conscript type fellows at all. It's sort of like a constant leapfrogging going on across all of Europe, a sort of competition to see who has the best looking soldiers and, oh, oh man, the French started wearing, you know, their hats in a certain fashion. Oh, well, we have to try and do that now because we can't, you know, we can't be seen as being, you know, five years behind the times as far as military uh, performance is concerned. And the appearance of the men on the field is integral to that appearance, to that perception, to just how modern a military really is. And while we may sit here from our modern perspectives and say to ourselves, well, how ridiculous, surely the military should be concerning itself with matters of efficiency and, and practicality and cost-effectiveness and things like that, not with fashion and looking better than the other guy. Well, it's important to keep in mind that while military fashion may not be the driving force that it once was in civilian wear, it certainly is still a very important issue. And if you don't think it is, just do a search for any sort of uniform change in your local, uh, you know, in your local regiment or whatever country, country you may be, and uh, see how many people get upset over how this look isn't as good as the last one.
Until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.